Hi and welcome to another episode of Dawncast. I'm Dai Lee. And I'm Kathy Ngo. And today we've got Julia, Julia Newbold, co-author of The Joy of Money and also editor at large of Money Magazine joining us. Welcome, Julia. Thank you very much, Di and Catherine. Yes, look for a declaration. Julia and I have known each other for more than two decades. We both started as journalists uh, f- uh, with Fairfax Community Newspaper. I was based out at Fairfield, and Julia, you were with the St George's Leader, wasn't it? That's right. Yeah, yeah. St George's and Sutherland. That's right. So there you go. So that's how long um, you know we've known each other go for. Way back, 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 <laughs> back. Um, but thanks for making the time um, to share your, you know, what you've been doing with Dawncast. Uh, but how are you, first of all, how are you going? How are you coping in this COVIDian time? Um, I don't mind the working from home part. I've been used to that. And um, I'm normally out three or four nights a week at the theatre and doing things. And it's actually quite a nice reset. But, you know, I do miss seeing friends and family a bit more regularly and coming to the end of it and wondering how we're going to get out of it all safely. Yeah, Um, Obviously, COVID-19 has really impacted the economy greatly. Yeah, absolutely. And I don't think we've really seen how much. I think, you know, previously when we had the GFC, the effect was more immediate. But this is, well, this is going to stretch out for a long time. Uh, your your book, um, the joy of money, is <laughs> is that a timely thing? I mean, you know. <laughs> well, actually, yes, it is a timely thing. It's not been a great time for us to be releasing a book where we can't get out and talk about it so much. But the ideas that we express in the book are very um, old, basic investment ideas, and all of them still hold true. And you know, any time is a good time to start. We avoid looking at our finances for every reason, but we need to at some point just say, well, today is where I start and not worry about anything that's going on, what we've done in the past or what the economy is doing right now, but just do what we can to get ahead. Mm. So you focus mainly on women in the book. Why is that? I mean, I have a feeling why, but I <laughs> just want to hear it from you. So we focus on women for a couple of reasons. Firstly, women um, aren't doing as well in the um, economy generally. There's still the gender pay gap and we're still retiring with, with less money than men. The, you know, the fastest growing group of homeless people is women over 55. So there's good reason to focus on women. And also we felt that um, other publications haven't focused on talking to women in a language we want to be spoken to. And it's not about dumbing things down. It is about removing jargon, which we don't think is helpful at all. And also talking about money as not an abstract, because as women, it's just part of our lives. And the whole idea of money is to allow us to do what we want to do, whether that's to send our children to private schools, you know, have a home in a certain area, be able to help family, whatever it is. There's no decision really that we can make that doesn't have some connection with money and that's how women think about it and that's how we wanted to talk about it in the book. I mean, women, like when we talk about finance or the financial sector, often men are the ones that get sort of put, you know, we hear from their perspective in terms of investment, in terms of finance. Um, How is your, did your book looked at, um, you know, why that's the case and how, how we can shift that? Yeah, well, we we look at the case that there's more men in the sector. And years ago, when I looked, when I was working at BT, we set up the Stellar Network, which was to help more women get into financial advice. And the idea of that was so that women um, investors and women in the community would have people that looked and sounded like them to represent them in the financial world because it's difficult to express yourself with someone who's really not on the same wavelength at all and many men even in meetings with couples would focus on the man in the couple so the women weren't getting you know proper treatment so we wanted to get more women into the industry to change that and so this book looks at teaching women so that they have access to the words, the terms, the ideas about investment. And so they build their own confidence so that they can do things. 
And we're not trying to avoid advice. We believe strongly in it, but we think that women have so little confidence in the investment market because it is so male dominated that we just wanted to make sure that you have enough information so that you do feel confident to go and talk to someone. Yeah, I don't know about you, Kathy, but uh, the word investment scares the hell out of me. Is it because you're commitment phobic? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. It's just, uh, as you said, Because it sounds very long term, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, it sounds, and a lot of money. Mm. Do you but know what I mean? It doesn't have to be, right? It doesn't have to be a lot of money, but some of it is long term. And we talk about, you know, when when you're putting money aside and when you're saving for the future, we talk about having, you know, the three buckets. You have the one that's for today and making sure that you put aside three months of it or any time that's terrible, like now, for instance, you're really seeing the value of that. And then we have a medium term investment, which is, you know, putting money into the stock market or um, into some investment vehicle that you're looking to invest till you want the money, maybe to have a house deposit or go on holidays or, you know, short term, which is around the five year mark. And then we have longer term, which is more the 10 year plus and you know being a property investor for example or buying an investment property that's not something that you would probably do for less than 10 it's looking at the different buckets that you can afford to put investments away for and then you can decide on what kind of investments are best for that what what is the the most basic um information a woman should have and should know when it comes to money this sounds so basic, but we don't all do it. And it's number one is to save or spend less than you earn. Mm. Yeah, because it's know, so easy but, to use the credit card. It's just tap and go. Yeah. Mm. yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, it's a good idea to aim to save 10 or 20% of what you're earning at any time. And the little tricks of um, if you get a pay rise, putting half of it away straight away then you still have a benefit of something that you didn't have yesterday but then you also have something for the future and it doesn't have to be the long-term future you might just want a holiday but we talk very much in the book about conscious spending and what we mean by that is you're not depriving yourself necessarily but you're not frittering away money in ways that you're not getting any enjoyment out of so for instance if you're working in town and you're buying lunch every day it just adds up and that's fine if you really enjoy it and it's something that you want to do. But if it's just money that you're unconsciously spending, then we want to, we want people to think about it and think, would you rather spend that money on that? Or would you rather, I don't know, buy a couture outfit or go on holiday or, you know, buy a new couch or whatever that is. Did you, I mean, how for your book, um, were there any, like, is it a, a research uh, of years or years of working in the industry, finding stories of women and, their, and then presenting examples uh, of, of the situations that many women face that without actually, you know, planning or knowing what they're doing? Uh, what, what's your book based on? So basically, uh, the idea was we've talked to a lot of women and we've talked to a lot of women about what they have um, experienced as good and bad in the financial world, what they need. And um, we then sat down and we worked out where we thought we could help improve what was already out there and make it really conversational and make it something that we know that it's ironic saying the joy of money, because for many women, they don't find joy in money. It doesn't bring ideas of joy. So we wanted to change it so that it did. So that if things, and I think that a lot of women and even a lot of men will think about, um, you know, not talking about finance because they don't feel confident about it and not talking about money, burying your head in the sand about, well, I don't want to look at my super. I don't really understand it. It's over there. It's something that I, I'm not going to focus on now. But as you get close to it, you suddenly, you know, really focused on it and it's like, well, how's this going to affect my life? Can I retire when I want? Can I afford to go on holidays when I've retired? How will I buy another car? And we're trying to get women involved today to do something, anything, to start focusing on their money today so that it makes things easier down the track. 
How did you get started in all of this? Because like at the beginning, uh, Di, you were saying that you two worked together in journalism. But yeah, she went into the money make yeah. money, <laughs> money, <laughs> money Which sector. Is very, very smart. <laughs> but how did your love for money and helping other people um, be money savvy? How did that start? Um, I studied economics at uni, and I really wanted to come out and get into stockbroking. But when I came out, it was a bad time, and really, it wasn't the fit for me. So I wanted to get into PR, which then made PR people say, well, you need to get writing experience first. And that's how I got into journalism. And then I really loved it. And then I edited a couple of magazines and then I, I went traveling. And when I came back, the jobs were in the money area. And a lot of people didn't want those jobs because they didn't feel that they understood finance or it was boring and so on. But for me, it kind of tied things together. I understood it. I knew the jargon. I knew that people, and this is also a bit passionate for me. I knew that the concepts are not difficult. We can all understand them, but it's like a secret code if you know the jargon or not. And if you don't know it, you tend to be intimidated by it. And I yes. felt, <laughs> I still feel very strongly that that's what's happening. And so we wanted to strip that away because it's really not true. If you don't understand something that someone's explaining to you in a money way, it, there's something wrong with it and you wouldn't invest in it. Mm. You know, people aren't necessarily cleverer with money. They just can use bigger words. But it should come down to something quite simple. And if you don't understand why that investment should make money, then steer clear of it. So how? So I'm just you know, for me, I have for years. I don't know what's for, like with you, Kathy, but for years, for me, the idea of understanding money, like what comes in and what goes out, I've never put my kind of mind to that. Uh, but I would say probably in the last six years. I have become more conscious in terms of trying to understand, not that I'm good at it, but trying to understand income expenditure for a business, but also in terms of managing my my own family budget. Um, do you think, have you found that with a lot of women in terms of they do their budgeting anyway, but they don't actually really... Yeah. Yeah, they think it's very separate to doing, you know, finance, but it's not. Because when you talk to a lot of financial advisors, it's not people who are earning the most money or putting their money into some whiz-bang investment scheme. It's those who just manage to save and save regularly and save a good proportion of their income that actually do better over the long term. I'm terrible at saving, I must confess. <laughs> so, uh, like, I know it's quite common sense to just spend less, but what are some of the ways that women or anyone can save a bit more um, what's your advice the best thing really is to put some money out of your pay packet away somewhere where you don't see it come in so have a separate account that maybe you, you siphon money into and that can grow and you don't touch it and it comes out of your pay before anything else because if you're expecting to save after you've spent everything you need to you know, for the month or fortnight or whatever your pay period is, you never have money to save. Right. It's only if you do that first. And that's, you know, one of those really old lessons from that Robert Kiyosaki book, you know, um, Rich Man, Poor Man. Yeah. Pay yourself first, put that savings away, and then that will grow and you won't even notice it. So would that be like a high interest account, like one of those um, or – it doesn't matter. Yeah, it doesn't really matter. doesn't matter. You know, as it grows, maybe you'll think of doing something with it, but put it out of sight so that you don't get tempted to touch it. Now, a lot of, uh, particularly Asians, they have a thick wad of cash yeah. under the mattress. Would you advise that? <laughs> <laughs> I think they're probably insured, but no. <laughs> you know, it's whatever whatever um, you feel really comfortable with. You know, that, but to have savings is so important. And I think... You know, when you look at multicultural Australia and you look at, um, you know, first generation and coming to this country, you come over with really great ideas of saving. And credit's not such a big thing and there's really good habits that you can learn. You've been in the financial sector uh, for over a decade now, um, you know, working as a journo for financial planning and yeah, super... Yeah, nearly 20 years. Yeah, oh, 20 years. There you go. Working uh, in financial planning in Super Review magazines, managing editor of Investor Info at Morningstar. What changes have you seen in terms of women's participation 
and knowledge around finance. Uh, has that improved? Yes, it has. And it's also improved like from the industry um, paying attention to women and realising well, we're a big customer base, really. So, you know, and no financial institution is going to do well without talking to women. When I first started talking to advisors, they would literally talk over my head about money things as if, you know, women don't understand. And I used to think to myself, I'm probably better educated in this than you are. And yet it was just the way it was. And I remember saying to one, I would never come to you as a client because you don't speak to me. You know, and I think that they've realised it's big business. And I think women have built confidence as well. And the more, um, you know, since I've worked in the industry, there was a time where people still didn't talk finance, but now you do. People are talking about their super and they're talking about, you know, whether to withdraw early or, you know, what their super's invested in and so on. It's become more common to actually talk about financial issues. Yeah, I mean, I don't know about your super, Cathy, but I, I think it's only in the last few months have I, I don't know why, but I started to trying to understand super because, oh, my God, I, can, I can't get my head around super. My I mean, su- yeah. Uh, my uh, super's I, gone down because of the – so I need to look at what my super is investing in. Yeah. Because but do we have to look at what our super is investing in? I mean, yeah, even the do. basic understanding of our super, saving, having a super, uh, I mean, luckily me being, uh, you know, formerly at the ABC, I, I had my, my, my super there, it's reserved – but I don't think many people nowadays have super even, and women in particular. Um, well, it depends what kind of job. If you've been working in a paid job, you t- if you've frozen. Been, if you've been freelancing, then she's um. There's technical uh, problem. Your your internet, Julia. <laughs> oh, there you go. Oh, Start oh, again. I can. I, I, if you're running your own business or you're freelancing, it's likely that you might not be putting money into super and I think there's a bit of a disconnect sometimes because for us working in the industry we think everybody knows and we think everybody understands and now you know I'm working at money magazine well people tend to read it because they know about money and they're interested and you still got a captive audience that you know understands but I'm realizing that a lot of people don't and a lot of people you know we've written the book so that it gives a good understanding of what super is and how to, you know, work it and so on. But until women hit probably 45, well, until anyone really hits 45, you're not interested because it's so far away that you're going to be able to use it. And the balance, you know, is is growing exponentially. So, you know, when you're 30, you might not have much in super, so it's not interesting at all. But once it starts to build a good balance and you're getting close to retirement, that's when you start looking at it. And that was one of the drivers for the book for me you know, thinking about, oh, when can I retire? Like, how am I tracking? And and in starting to look at it and talk to friends around the same age who maybe wanted to change jobs or careers or move into state or do all sorts of things. And it all came down to money. And it came down to, well, what do you have? Like, where are your assets? How much do you have in super? How much is it likely to grow before you retire? Before anything can, any other decisions can be made. I mean, the the culturally and linguistic uh, community, as you've identified I think uh, uh, I think the whole super concept I mean I, you know our mums for instance wouldn't have yeah they wouldn't have had it had yeah. the whole super thing um, but I'm just thinking as, as you were speaking Julia how do you then educate uh, I mean obviously through this podcast we can share and we can get people start to think about super uh, but that's I think that's a, a market there that has to be tapped Yeah, I think that's probably true. I mean, the best benefit really with super is that it's an enforced saving and it's very tax effective. So if you were investing that money outside the superannuation fund, you would be paying tax on the earnings at a much higher rate and it would take longer to grow. But it's kind of protected Mm. where it is. But people don't understand that. So I think we do have to come out and talk about it more and, I don't know, make it somehow sexier. We um Oh, you know, BT a few years ago, <laughs> yeah. they couldn't really get people involved in looking at their super because they couldn't imagine themselves old. And then we got one of those apps on the phone which ages people. And once people could see themselves old, it was a whole different way of thinking. Mindset. <laughs> um, there's also the concept of, I was talking to a friend recently about good debt and bad debt. And I think for, well, how I was taught growing up was to pay your debts 
as quickly as possible. Mm. But then it's like, how do you save when you like yeah. everything that you earn is just paying off debts and, and no debt. Like the mindset of you know no no debt. Like some people said, no, we well, don't. We can't afford to have debts. The idea of good debt is if that debt is building an asset for the future. So if you're buying an investment property or you're investing in a business or something that you think will grow and will grow at a rate that will justify you paying those interest rates on that debt, then that's good debt. But if you're paying debt on a car or something that you know will devalue over time, then that's bad debt. Mm. So how do you think we can get more women or even cold communities, or culturally and linguistically diverse communities, into the investment mindset? What, what should we do? What advice should we give them to get into that space more, to start thinking about their future? Well, I think it's very important that women are independent. Whether you're in a relationship or not, you should always feel that you can cope on your own. And I think it's important to know that you have an income, that you have savings, that if you're in a terrible situation, you can get out of it. If you're in a job that you hate, you don't have to put up with, you know, that sort of thing because you've got a bit of income as a, or a bit of money as a buffer that will get you through a period to find another job or, or you know, to leave a relationship or whatever it is. And I just think that that's so important for everybody's peace of mind, really. Is there is there a, a too late, like, could there be a, a point whereby it's too late to invest, like you've reached a certain stage in life that forget about thinking about investment or, or planning? It's never too late, right? Is, is, is there a time? Well, is, there, is there a point there where you think it's too late? There might be a too late, late time, but we're not near it. <laughs> you know, if you look at today, people are living to 100. There's a long time to go. Yeah. And even when you get to access your super, even though that might be close to 70 now, well, you've still got another 20 or 30 years to go that you might need that money. So, you know, once upon a time, people would take out their super in cash and, you know, figure out what to do with it. Now people are needing to invest it because it's still got to last a long time. We're living longer. Much longer now. Um, and there's also the whole idea of insurance that people don't really understand about income protection and protecting, you know, what you're looking at to sustain you for the next number of years. Um, people just don't know about it and no. don't understand. It. People might have life insurance because it's part of their super. But, you know, more importantly, do we have some sort of insurance that if we live but with some sort of disability or have an illness and need time out, are we insured for that kind of thing? My God. Well, very important questions. My gosh. Um. <laughs> I know. I have an idea. Why don't like have a girls' night out yeah. and then you have an agenda where you talk about money <laughs> and oh, tick, tick, tick. Okay, then we can have the cocktails. <laughs> well, they are becoming more popular actually. Is you know, it? I've been to a few in recent months where – there's a whole group of women that get together and talk finances. And, and we're great at women at sharing information once we know. Oh, I had this great solicitor. I had this great advisor. Or, you know, I put money here or I've invested in the stock market and make it into a game. Oh, well, my, I might have to come to see you then, Julia. <laughs> 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 um, how, how quickly do you think uh, we will pick up, if the economy will pick up post-COVID-19? No idea, really. It, it just depends on how um, businesses cope. I mean, the financial institutions like the banks and so on, they've put mortgages on hold and, you know, how are they going to then react because they've got to make up that money at some point? You know, they've all held off making people redundant up till now, but who knows how that's going to play out in the future. And we're all, you know, realising we don't have to spend as much because we're all at home, at home yeah. is that going to happen when we come out? Because that's going to impact a lot of businesses if we become used to not going to restaurants or theatre or buying clothes or whatever it is. It, is that going to be, have a long tail effect on the, the economy? 
So have you been saving all these months <laughs> from going out? I'm very good at online shopping. <laughs> I must say you have fantastic wardrobe. Not that I've seen it, but like every time I see pictures of you, it's just <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, it's just a stunning, stunding wardrobe. Um, I actually remember going to like an Alex Perry event or something like that. I think you were the host or something. Like uh, yeah, that. Yeah, mm. yeah. And he was saying um, this is kind of, Related but not related. But he was saying how um, if you really want to be serious about your career, invest in the clothes that you wear to work because how you show up uh. is so important and that will determine, um, you know, your career um, development for the next couple of years. And Do you think so? Yeah, I think so. Like if you yeah, yeah, invest in yourself and looking good all the time, which you always do die, <laughs> um, then people are going to take you seriously. It's like a whole um, personal branding thing. Mm -hmm. uh, but some but some people, um, I know that they said, well, we're going to challenge that, that whole perception of wearing suits. We can't, why can't we just wear T-shirts, for instance, you know? Um, it's cheaper. You don't have to invest. Ima imagine buying constantly. It's it's a lot of money. Well, unless you're Mark Zuckerberg, <laughs> <laughs> it's not going to work. Yeah. We're, we're in a very in superficial world. world. It's very important. You know, you are judged on it, and and you feel like well, I probably judge other people on it as well. Mm. Mm. Um, so, what's your tips and advice to women um, who have not started to think about investment and? who've got no idea about super, what are some of the tips that you can give them to kick start that? that well, number one, buy our book, which is available everywhere. Yeah. But um, seriously, I think it's important to not worry about what's happened in the past. No matter how old you are, what you've done, what you have, what you, you don't have, start today. Don't look backwards. Just, you know, look at learning something else and start today and have a look at your super, see where it's invested, you know, see if you need multiple accounts or whether you need to put it into one. Like there's, there's reasons for consolidating and there's also reasons that you might not want to consolidate. But, you know, just starting to read a little bit more about the economy and your finances and making sure that you feel independent and confident to make decisions down the track of what you can and can't afford to do and what kind of job you need to do and how long you might need to work at it for. I think one of the things that I've learned from this whole experience of COVID is it must be very stressful if you, you have so much debt that, you, you know, even having your pay cut for a certain period has impacted everything about your life. Like, I think this is a time where we really have the opportunity to evaluate what we think is worth it and what isn't. It is a real time for reset for people. Thank you so much, Julia. Great yeah, great advice there. Um, thanks. That's Ju that was Julia Newbolt, uh, co-author of The Joy of Money. And I will definitely try and grab that book and read to see if I can get some tips there. Uh, we will make sure that the, the, the book uh, will be, the link to that will be available on the podcast. And uh, I am Dai so thanks for joining us here on Dawncast. And I'm Kathy Ngo. Make sure you subscribe uh, to the channel and click on the bell as well just to get a notification for new content. And have a good day. Bye. Thanks everyone. See Bye. ya. Bye.